can now begin the actual program. It is my pleasure, my honor, to be able to introduce to you uh, Jerome Scott. Jerome was a labor organizer in the auto plants of Detroit in the 1960s and 70s, and a community organizer, a popular educator, and an author and author. And he's been in the South since the 1970s. He was a founding member and former director of Project South, Institute for the Elimination of Poverty and Genocide, where he works in Atlanta. Uh, he served on the National Planning Committee of the U.S. Social Forum and has been active in grassroots global justice and other organizations. He serves on the National Council of the League of Revolutionaries for New America. He's an author and co-author of numerous chapters and articles on race, class, movement building, and the revolutionary process, and is a contributing editor to four popular education toolkits, including The Roots of Terror and Today's Globalization. He was a co-recipient of the American Sociological Association's 2004 Award for the Public Understanding of Sociology. And one of the things I'm really excited about is he's working on a book tracing the history of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, for forthcoming from the University of Georgia Press. Please welcome. Uh, if, the, if we were in an audience together in, a, in one room, I'd say put your hands together for Jerome Scott. Take it oh, away. thank you, Lou. And, and thank you all for having me. I'm um, really excited about being here and being able to talk about these critical times that we're experiencing in our life today. I really like uh, the fact that, that this conference is dealing with culture and the role culture plays in the revolutionary process. I think that's a critical topic. You know, it reminds me of um, our time in the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in Detroit, you know, where we had Motown, and although Motown resisted for years and years about putting out, you know, uh, music that really reflected the, the moment of history that we were involved in, that music still broke through. I mean, you, you know, Marvin Gaye and what's going on and, you know, what good is war? You know, the, the questions that we were dealing with, there was a reflection in our culture and some leadership in the culture that divided us with some context that we thoroughly needed. And that remains true today, you know, that culture plays a, a really important role. But anyway, so I, I thank you for framing it that way, and I thank you for having me. Um, there's just a few things, you know, my, the title of my talk today is going to be Fascism working class resistance and the revolutionary process. And I'm gonna frame it in the context of consciousness, vision, and strategy. You know, consciousness to us just means that, you know, we're con continuously educating ourselves and developing our understanding of what's going on in the world today and trying to accept that as it is, as we experience it. You know, and which is sometimes very difficult to do. But the main thing we're facing today, I I believe, is this whole worldwide threat of fascism. Now, when when I was back when I was a younger dude back in the sixties and seventies, when we talked about fascism, we always talked about it as fascism developing someplace else. That we didn't believe that fascism could develop in the United States because, you know, it was too democratic, you know, and, and there was too much of spread of ownership of, of land and property and all that. And, and the basis of fascism would just be too difficult to develop. Well, we realize today how things change and how concepts that we thought could never take a hold in the United States is really taking a hold not only in the United States, but throughout throughout the world. And you got to ask the question, why is it that fascism is developing throughout the world again? Not on the basis that it developed in the 30s and 40s, but on this new basis. 
And I think the main thing that we have to realize is that, you know, the one topic that just about everybody is talking about today is this whole topic of technology and what it's going to mean for the development of society and what it's going to mean for the development of our economy and what is it going to mean for the development of our education. You know, it, it, it's like this whole revolution in technology is penetrating every aspect of American life. And the one aspect that they don't talk about enough is the fact that we are transforming the way things are produced in this country. You know, this society is organized around a society that produces things industrially. The Industrial Revolution, the overthrow of agriculture as the main uh, producing sector, you know, it, it called for a complete change of the entire society. Every institution was destroyed in that process. And we're witnessing the same sort of process now, although we don't talk about it in that way. You know, that the more we replace the way we produce goods and services, the more capitalist society has to be reorganized around that particular mode of producing goods and services. The problem is that when you change, have a dramatic change like that in society, it disrupts everything. And that's what we're experiencing, this disruption of capitalist function of society and, and all of its capitalist institutions. Um, the problem is that this unleashes a tremendous response. And what the capitalist is thinking about is, how are we going to be able to control the response that this transition of the world is, is causing? You know, this disruption of their ability to, to organize and provide society for its needs. You know, how are they going to control the response? When they looked at the response that happened with the murder of George Floyd, and they saw that worldwide thing happen, that was a wake up call for them. Now, it's not like they just got started with trying to prepare for fascism at that moment. They were already preparing. Like one example that I'd like to cite is this whole question of Cop City. You know, uh, here in Atlanta, uh, the struggle to prevent Cop City from happening is raging, you know, particularly after the murder of that one demonstrator. Um, the, the public, the local area around the construction of that cop city has come out and are really fighting to prevent it from happening. But they're fighting to prevent it from happening because they know that not only is the land stolen that they're putting it on, but also this whole question of preparing for urban warfare, preparing the police and, and others for urban wealth, warfare you know, that's a, that's a question that they have to tackle. And that's a question I think we need to tackle in this session. Why is that such an urgency? Such an urgency that so-called progressive democratic mayors like the one we have here don't have a choice but to fight to get that cop city built. You know, and I think it's all because they're preparing. They know that there's going to be tremendous resistance to fascism in this country, like there's tremendous resistance throughout the world to fascism. And they want to be able to not lose control of this society. And they figure the only way to lose, not to lose control of this society is to be prepared for urban warfare. And that's what they're building these cop cities around. Now, everybody sort of know about the cop city in Atlanta, but there's one being built in San Diego. There's one operating in Chicago. There's one planned for LA. So they're strategically placing these cop cities around the country so that they have the apparatus to prepare for urban warfare. Now, what does urban warfare have to do with the development of fascism? And, you know, like I said, that, that process started long ago, and that's the democratic end. You know, I think that the police being paired for urban warfare is one of the preparations that they're making to secure, you know, their control of this capitalist society. So fascism, not a... Couple of things I want to say about fascism, other than just the the role that the Democratic Party is playing in that process through these cop cities, is that you know you got to think about it. What what really is fascism, and how can they bring it about? The most important thing I think that we need to make sure we understand 
is fascism is not a Trump thing. Fascism is not a Republican thing. Fascism is a section of the ruling class that is supporting the Republican Party and financing the Trump campaign that understands that they believe their understanding of what they believe is that we have to have fascism in order to maintain capitalism with, you know, because this world is going through such a transition as it's going to cause a basic response. So they're preparing to, to try to control uh, the system no matter what happens. Now, so fascism is definitely a class thing. It's not a party thing between the Democrats and the Republicans. It's a class thing. And many of those same uh, elements within the ruling class that supports the development of fascism supports both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Now, we have to concede that the Republican Party is the leading force in this. But we have to also understand that both of these parties are parties of the ruling class. The one thing about fascism is that it's a class thing. It's not a personal thing. It's not an individual thing. We can stop Donald Trump right now, but the motion toward fascism will continue. The second thing I think we got to understand about fascism is that fascism is not another economy. You know, it's still the capitalist system. Right now, right now, and my time is going by fast. That's where I put that time on. You know, uh, uh, right now, um, fascism is developing. And you've got, you know, the fact that it's developing throughout the world and the fact that, you know, it's a class thing and the fact that it's part of maintaining the capitalist system. I mean, right now we live under what we call bourgeois democracy, which is not that good of a system either. But fascism replaces that with a dictatorship, a, a dictatorship where the rule of law is out the door to, to whatever extent is in the door on the bourgeois democracy is out of the door on the fascism. So fascism is another way of protecting capitalism. It's not a different uh, form of organizing society. So those are, I think, the two most important things that we have to realize about fascism. You know, so this, so, and fascism, you know, I mean, the point is that we can stop it, but we cannot stop fascism in a form that says the solution to fascism is to go back or to keep bourgeois democracy. We have to fight fascism in such a way that we also are lining ourselves up to fight, you know, against capitalism and to fight for a new society. So that's the... Those are the most important things I wanted to say about fascism. I wanted to say a couple of things about uh, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, and I'm I'm gonna try to do this in the next five minutes. You know, it's it, it's important to me that the League of Revolutionary Black Workers and the book that we're in the process of writing really uh, speaks to the origin story of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America and how the League of Revolutionary Black Workers entered into that process. And the main thing that, that I wanted to say about that is that when you organize workers, and we, you know, we was organizing Black workers initially, and then we came to the understanding that we had to, had to organize the working class and not just Black workers. And, and that becomes critical because, you know, the immediate question is, how do you organize a class that doesn't recognize itself as a class? Well, that tells us that the first question we got to do is to politically educate our constituencies, our neighbors, our, you know, our people at our workplace, you know, because we got to educate them to realize that if you work for a living, if the only way that you can survive is that you work and get a paycheck, you're part of a class, that working class. And you got to be conscious that the way that you win advances is by winning advancing for the class and not just for you. I mean, it seems like the UAW finally learned that lesson after many, many years of trying to represent only its members. It came out in this, in this summer, in its track, as a representative of the working class. 
and demanded that any advance that they make will be an advance for the working class. I think that's good for us because it advances our ability to raise the consciousness of workers so that we recognize ourselves as a class and begin to develop our strategy of how we're going to fight as a class. The other thing about the League of Revolutionary Black Workers is, you know, I talked about culture and I talked about Motown, but we also knew that we had to have our own culture. So we developed, you know, we we developed uh, a group called the, the Red Label Strugglers, you know, which was a proletarian group of working class folks that developed working class songs for the 60s and the 70s. One of the things that we are looking for in this moment is the development of songs and poems and all that for this, this iteration of the revolutionary process. The, thing, the one thing that comes to mind that I thought was really interesting for this moment is that I think it was the last poet back in the 60s that wrote the poem, The Revolution Would Not Be Televised. And what they didn't say is that although the revolution might not be televised, genocide will. And that's what we're witnessing now. I want to move on to this question of Palestine and the war. And that's what we're witnessing now. It's this whole question of genocide being televised, you know, and the UN arguing about whether it's genocide or whether it's just a crime against humanity, which you know, we can talk about that in the discussion, but it don't make sense that that's the way they're trying to frame the discussion because they're both, you know, uh, efforts that have to be stopped, whether it's a crime against humanity or what's really happening is an ongoing televised genocide. We have got to be able to stop it. And the world is waking up. I mean, this is one hell of a teachable moment. And, and of course, the most important thing about this war is this okay, is this question of um, the role that the United States is playing. Don't you don't you wonder how the United States can propose a hundred billion dollars on the table when every day they tell us that they're broke? that they can't spend anything on jobs, they can't spend anything on healthcare, they can't spend anything on homelessness. You know, it seems to me that we have a lot of ammunition about how our government is spending our money, our tax money, to perpetrate genocide and not at all willing to spend a penny on what's happening to us, the working class of this country. All right, let me just try to sum this up. So we know that what we're faced with is fascism. And if we don't mobilize and organize the working class to prevent it, it's going to overtake us. We know that the world is in transition, and that's what they're trying to protect. The question today is, what is the role of the revolutionaries in this process? And I think our role is basically twofold. One is we have to we have to lead the process of politically educating the working class, particularly around this question of it being a class for itself, being a class that fights for itself. Because the lifting up of the working class will lift up society as a whole. The only way that we could do that is by going on the offensive. The last offensive that, that was really effective of course, was 1968. We can talk about that in the discussion as well. You know, where workers throughout the world, from Vietnam to Mexico, you know, rose up to fight, you know, for advancements in their society. We have to go on the offensive again. We have to take the fight, not just to preserve what we have fought for years and years and years, but we have to take the fight to the offensive where we're demanding the vision of the world that we need and want. You know, and that vision, of course, is a world without homelessness, a world where we rid the world of its competitive nature and create a society of cooperation. And with that, I will stop and open it up for questions and discussion. Thank you.